Okay, perfect. All right, I think we have everyone. I'm just gonna do a final check. Okay, perfect. Great. Well, Carlos Irrate, Namaskar, and welcome. We are so happy that you are all here and excited to present our second philanthropy virtual cooking fundraiser on making a coloquizopita. My name is Nicole and I am a board member of Fili, the organizers of this event. We just want to start off by thanking you all so much for being here and supporting a very special cause. Before we get started, we have just a few announcements. First, I would like to thank our chef, Sophia Berg, for volunteering her talents to make this event possible. You can follow Sophia on Instagram at Sophia's Cuisina or on her blog at sophiascuisina.com. I will post her contact information in the chat box shortly. Sophia is a registered dietitian nutritionist and will be sharing some health and nutritional tips along the way today. Our second greeting that you heard is because this is a fundraiser for 150 children at the Theotokos Girls Orphanage in West Bengal, India. So um, we will talk more about this orphanage throughout the night and I will include the website link and our social media contacts in the chat box below. Um, on that note, feel free to enter your questions in the chat box below and keep checking it for important information. Additionally, I will be muting everyone as you come in. You can unmute yourselves. Um, we do this just to avoid background noise. Um, and then please ensure that your Zoom settings are on speaker mode, not gallery view. If you have any trouble with this, you just can look on the top right corner of your screen. Um, look for something that says speaker view and click that. You'll know you're in the right view. If you see uh, Sophia at the center and then all the participants lined up at the top, I will also be spotlighting to make this easier. Um, I do recommend you're on a desktop. If you are on a phone, it will be a little bit more challenging. So if you have any trouble with any of these settings or any questions, feel free to uh, talk to me in the chat box and I'm happy to help you troubleshoot. So with that, I will pass it on to Sophia to start the cooking demonstration. And hold on one moment while we get that set up. Okay, go ahead, Sophia. But in my free time, I love to cook, especially Greek food. Um, so tonight I'll be showing you how to make a koloki papita, um, and I'll be using pumpkin since that's just the fall fruit. Um, but kolokiti in Greek just means squash. So you might have had koloki papitas made with zucchini or butternut squash, but I just thought pumpkin would be perfect for fall. It's officially fall now, which feels so crazy. <laughs> Um, but I'm also going to make it sweet with some of those warm spices. Um, you can also make it savory by just omitting the sugar and the spices in this recipe and adding herbs like dill or mint um, and feta. But I thought it'd be a nice little treat to make it sweet and all those warm spices like cinnamon and things like that are actually all originally from like India and the Southeast Asian region. So I thought it would be a nice little echo back to the cause of tonight, um, which really isn't learning how to make a lakitopita, but supporting the orphanage in India and also system Korea. So, and also I'm a big component of the Mediterranean diet, so everything in moderation, including sweet food, and I really love to bake, and I think it's really fun, especially for special occasions like tonight. So, um, if you have my recipe, you'll see that we'll need about 12 cups of fresh pumpkin, um, I like to use fresh pumpkin. I just think it gives it a better texture and flavor. Um, you can use canned cured pumpkin um, if that's just easier for you. You might just get a little like denser texture. So you can also use any kind of pumpkin you find. So some people like these smaller, um, they're called sugar pie pumpkins. Um, they, to me, kind of taste the same as a regular pumpkin, but some people will say they're a little bit sweeter and better for desserts like this. But you can also use kind of like a big pumpkin like this, and all you do is roast it in the oven um, with a little oil, and that just softens it up, and that's how I got all the pumpkin here today. So 
Um, when you have all your pumpkin, I've got eight cups here, and I have another about four cups in this bowl, and we're gonna add this to a large pot uh, on the stove and kind of cook it down. Uh, because pumpkin and squash has a lot of moisture and water in it, and if we were to put it kind of directly into our pizza, it's gonna make it really soggy and not so good. So um, I'm gonna head over to the stove and we'll start over there. So yeah, you can um, get a large pot like this and then put it on like medium heat. And just dump the fresh pumpkin into the pot or if you have canned pumpkin. And I'm going to put four more cups in there. It's about four cups. So it doesn't have to be exact. Also, if you have any leftover pumpkin, like I'm going to have some leftover, uh, it freezes really well. So that's one thing that I do is like for falls and pumpkins and season. Um, you can roast a bunch of pumpkin and then just kind of take all the flash and put it in a freezer bag and freeze it. It freezes really well. So once it starts heating up, um, as you can see, my pumpkin's kind of in chunks. So I want to keep a few chunks in the bullet of pizza, but I want to break up um, most of this just with a wooden spoon. And so some of the things that we're going to do to draw the moisture out of this pumpkin is obviously heat it up and kind of get it to a simmering point. You'll probably see some like water collecting at the bottom of the pot. Um, and we just want that to kind of start bubbling. So we're also going to add um, about a teaspoon of salt. So you can go ahead and add your salt in if you'd like. That's going to draw some water out. And um, then we're also going to add in a cup of sugar, and that will help that as well. And sugar will also kind of help to break down all of the pumpkin fibers and everything like that. Um, you can use brown sugar too if you like. I haven't tried that, but the only difference between like granulated sugar and brown sugar is that the brown sugar kind of has uh, some less of molasses in it. So it could give you kind of a richer flavor if you like that. Um, I suppose you could also use other kind of sweeteners like honey and maple syrup. What I would keep in mind is that if you use honey or maple syrup, um, that has water and moisture in it. So you might have to cook it on the stove a little longer just to kind of get all of that evaporated off. Um, Sophia, we have our first question. Can you tell us a little bit about the baking of the pumpkin prior to getting it into the pot? Yeah, yeah. So essentially what I did is I, Take my pumpkin, that's the big one, and I cut the top off, so I cut the stem off, and then I just took a knife and sliced it right down the middle, so it was in two halves. Uh, and then I scooped out all the seeds and kind of all the stringy insides of the pumpkin, and I saved the seeds, though, because I like to have uh, roasted pumpkin seeds as a snack. They're actually really high in protein and really high in iron and B vitamin. Um, but once you have your pumpkin cut in half, essentially all you do is rub it with either vegetable oil or I use grapeseed oil. Um, and then you place your two halves face down uh, on a sheet pan with parchment paper. Um, and then you just roast your pumpkin in the oven at uh, 375 degrees for about an hour. Um, and when you'll know when your pumpkin is done when you put like a knife through it and the knife goes through really easily, like, like a knife going through really soft butter. You want your pumpkin to be really nice and cooked through like that. You don't want it to be too hard, otherwise this is harder to kind of break up those chunks. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna add my sugar in now too. My pumpkin's heating up. Also kind of fun nutrition facts about pumpkin, it's Super high in beta carotene, which is a form of vitamin A, and also high in vitamin C, and those are both antioxidants. So uh, we hear a lot about antioxidants nowadays and how they're really good for us. Um, and essentially, what antioxidants do is help decrease inflammation in our bodies. So fruits and vegetables are super high in antioxidants, and the more we eat, less inflammation we have in our bodies. So 
kind of look like that. So, I don't want this to take you up a little bit more, but as you can see, it's already broken down a good bit. Okay. And then, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, two tablespoons of butter. This will just kind of make it nice and creamy. Um, you can also use oil if you'd like. So one real easy way to make this uh, dish vegan or fasting is to just omit the butter for like, oil, like olive oil. Um, it won't make the filo, like when you brush the butter on the filo, with, instead of using butter, you use oil, it won't be quite as flaky. Um, but it's just an easy way to make it fasting. But I like to add a little butter, it makes it a little bit richer. I'm using unsalted butter. I feel like it's easier to kind of control the level of salt in my dish if I use unsalted butter and then I can just add more salt if I need to. So that's getting me on it. Um, now I'm going to add in some of my spices. So let's see. I feel like we don't really think a lot about where our spices come from or kind of what they look like when they're not all ground up. So I actually have some like of the whole, whole versions of the spices here that I thought I would show you guys. Can you hear me okay with this bubbling? I think so. Sounds like I'll go up enough. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well with this bubbling? Yeah, okay. Yes. So the first thing I have that I'm gonna add is ground cinnamon. So cinnamon comes from a tree actually, it's like the inner bark of a tree. So if you buy cinnamon sticks, um, that's kind of what that is. It's a bark of a tree, so you know, it's kind of cool. And you can add this, you can pop a cinnamon stick in here and add um, this as well, but you just want to see it out before you take it. And cinnamon comes from that Southeast Asian region, but actually uh, the cinnamon tree that's called like, the tree cinnamon tree is actually from India originally. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then the next spice I'm going to add in is, I believe this is nutmeg. Yeah, nutmeg. And nutmeg is also from that area of the world, and it's used actually a lot in Indian dishes and savory and tea dishes. Um, and I actually, until recently, had never used cold nutmeg before, but it's actually pretty easy and cool to use. So, Now, it just looks like this, like these little seeds. And if you want to use it in a dish, um, all you do is take a little like microplane and like a little grater, and you can grate some right in there. So, it smells really good. Definitely something like to keep around. Great. And then, next thing I'm going to add in are some cloves. So cloves are um, really strong. So the cinnamon, I think it added like one and a half teaspoons, and then the nutmeg, I think it added about a four teaspoon. Um, the ground cloves, I'm only adding an eighth teaspoon. It's just a much stronger spice. Some people really like cloves. Um, I, I like it, but not in excess. So we're just gonna add an eighth teaspoon to this. Uh, we have another question. Do you find uh -huh. fresh nutmeg is more flavorful than already grated nutmeg? Yes, it's definitely stronger. Um, so I would use a little bit um, less of it than if you were going to put in ground nutmeg. Okay. And I do have some cold cloves here as well. Um, I don't think people use whole cloves very often. Um, sometimes for like the syrup recipes for like Guatemala well, Rico or things like that, they want you to put like a cinnamon stick and whole cloves into it just to kind of like increase the flavor. But they're kind of like these weird, like, you know, stick looking things. But, um, uh, those are kind of cool as well. They're also from the Southeast Asian area. And then I'm gonna add in some ginger. 
So ginger is actually a root, um, and I love ginger. I think it's a really nice way to add like some warmth to this dish. Um, and ginger actually has a lot of um, like medicinal properties to it. So some people use ginger for nausea, um, especially for women who are pregnant and have morning sickness. Um, ginger usually helps kind of relieve that nausea. It's also a nice um, after a big meal. Sometimes I'll have like a little ginger chew, I feel like that kind of helps digest everything. So love ginger as well. And you can also get crushed ginger. Um, I have some here. It's just like a, a root. Um, and you kind of can peel back the skin here and then kind of grate the crushed ginger. And I would also use less of that um, as well, as that's going to be like, pretty potent compared to the ground ginger. And then the last thing I have here is um, about a teaspoon of ground allspice. So allspice is actually the only uh, spice we can tonight that's not from like, the Southeast Asian Indian region. Allspice is actually from in the Caribbean. Uh, some people call it Jamaican peppercorns, and it's called allspice because uh, people who discovered it thought it had it kind of incorporated flavors from cinnamon, cloves, and nutmeg, so it kind of all the spices. So it's kind of interesting. But it's starting to smell really good. I kind of want to let this cook down a little bit more. Let me see if I can show you guys what this looks like. Come on. So this is kind of what we have now. There's still a good amount of liquid in there, and you can probably see the steam coming out. So we want to keep uh, cooking this for at least like five more minutes, uh, maybe more if you have more time. Um, and while this is kind of cooking down, I will um, send it over to Anna to talk a little bit more about uh, cherry uh, we're raising like for tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Yalarakis. I hope you're all well tonight. Um, I just want to, for those of you that know the Theodokos Girls and Boys Orphanage, um, you know that Sister Nectaria has devoted and dedicated her entire life to the orphanage. She arrived in um, Calcutta uh, in the early 1990s to help open the Greek Orthodox Church, the Church of the Transfiguration in Calcutta. Um, there was a huge um, Greek community that was in um, the, the West Bengal area from the time, um, I would say from the late 1800s. And I do believe, as Sophia is talking about all the wonderful spices and bringing all those spices into Greece, um, the East India Trading Company had such an enormous impact um, between the spices of East India and Constantinople. So. I think all those spices intermingled, you know, probably way back from Alexander the Great, but more in our modern day um, in the past hundred years or so through the East India Trading Company. Um, it's interesting to see that the Greeks that were there were actually um, participants and uh, merchants in the East India Trading Company when one goes to the church in Calcutta. So bringing back to, um, Sister Nectaria, when she arrived in India in the early 90s, um, the human condition was extremely broken. Um, lots of human trafficking um, beyond um, tolerable and beyond palatable. And what she saw was um, the great need for starting an orphanage of taking in the babies, those little girls that were the, the victims of the trafficking. Um, and to start stopping the cycle of human trafficking. And over 25 years, Sister has taken in thousands of young girls and many, many, many have their lives transformed over the years. Many have gotten married, many have gone on to well-paying jobs, many um, have stayed on with the school and are now teachers in the school. So that is one of the great, incredible successes of the orphanage. Um, in 2017, I received a call um, from Father Alan Boyd in San Jose asking if there was anyone here in LA who could help um, with the school that Sister Nicteria was trying to build. 
and that was my first introduction to the incredible set of ladies, Roberta and Rosa and Cleo, you're amazing. Um, Nicole, love you, um, look forward to working with you. And of course, um, my complete dedication and fondness and um, support of Presbytera Lisa and Maria and um, Father Gregory, who was the root of this um, incredible project starting back in 2008. So coming uh, full um, circle back to 2017, we set out to shoot a documentary to bring the issues, the, um, the visual effects of what really goes on in India and throughout the world. Um, human trafficking is, um, I will quote, his all holiness sins before our eyes and it's our duty in any way, shape or form um, to help solve this cycle. Um, we were fortunate enough to shoot the first documentary, Ekota, and then went back in 2019 when the school was built and um, shot the follow-up documentary. Um, through those, one can see the effects, what happens to the children, the selling of the children, the raping of the girls. Um, it's all evident. These are harsh, brutal realities, um, but um, and difficult conversations to have. But I appreciate all of you um, for joining on, supporting Sophia, and most importantly, supporting this incredible cause of saving these children. Um, the St. Ignatius School has been built and um, they were in complete transformation up until May, or I guess March when COVID started and the grounds shut down in May, Cyclone Amphan um, completely decimated the Theodokos Girls and Boys Orphanage grounds. Um, incredible support from all of you, incredible, incredible support. And the donations have come in to help restore the grounds, the roofing, the glass. The, the beautiful sign um, of the St. Ignatio School that was completely flipped upside down. Um, but the challenges are many. They're constant. Um, and the children are in such need of support. But the one thing that I do know um, that the children's love is far beyond what we can ever imagine. Um, I had the witness, I had the personal pleasure and witness of seeing and feeling the love that flows effortlessly from these girls and boys. And the girls especially need the support, but the boys as well. And the current issue is that the boys well has now dried. And so we are continuously asking for your support, your love, your connection, your prayer um, in any way, shape or form um, for these boys. And we thank you. And as always, I thank you all. And I pray Panagia, our most blessed Theodokos, completely covers you and she threads this incredible fabric of love amongst everyone who supports this cause. Thank you, Anna. We'll bring it back to Sophia to continue the demonstration. Thank you, Anna. Just want to a little bit more about that. Um, so we are now kind of getting closer to the end of our filling for the Holy Book because I'm being done. Um, I, there are two more things that I'd like to add to this filling just to kind of break up um, the pumpkin a little bit. So I'm going to add um, one cup of chopped walnuts, just kind of roughly chopped. I don't like too small um, chopped walnuts. I kind of like to put some big chunks in there as well. And stir that in. Walnuts are also um, really high in omega-3 fatty acids. So um, omega-3s are another one of those things that are really good for us and are anti-inflammatory. So we have the antioxidants and omega-3s in this dish. Um, and then, last thing I'm going to add is a half cup of raisins. Um, I add a half cup because I, I don't love raisins a ton. Um, I think they're really good in here to kind of break up some of these flavors. But um, if you really love raisins and you want more raisins in your pizza, then you can definitely add a cup. 
But I'm just going to stick with a half a cup. Okay. So um, you could definitely let this kind of simmer and boil off some more of that moisture if you have more time. Um, this is looking pretty good, and we have one more thing to add, which, which is really going to soak up any excess moisture, and that's the semolina flour. So I'm just going to kind of stir everything in. And then I'm going to turn the heat off on this stove. And then I'm going to bring this back to the other station and then we can kind of let this cool and uh, get our filo dough ready and stir in our semolina flour. So once you have your filling all done, um, you're going to need a cup of the semolina flour. Um, it's pretty easy to find in stores. Um, I know there's some, also some Greek brands that have really great um, semolina flour, but you're usually able to find it okay. So here I have my cup and I'm just going to stir it in. And it should uh, kind of soak up any excess water and form more of a paste. You can also let your filling kind of cool a little bit before you do this. Um, you could definitely do this filling ahead of time. Um, kind of, you could do it in the morning and then let it sit in the fridge and then um, heat it back up. I would heat it back up just because sometimes when things sit in the fridge or the freezer, I, all this water kind of condenses and gathers. So if you were to make this filling in the morning, but you wanted to bake something fresh that evening, um, I would, after you pull it out of the fridge, put it back on the stove to kind of boil off any extra liquid. But let's see, it's a little bit not better. And this will kind of thicken up as it cools as well. And let me see if I can kind of hold this up and show you what it looking like. So our filling kind of went from being really loose to kind of having more of like a paste. Is that okay? okay. So, and if your filling's just not thickening up, um, you could definitely add a little bit more semolina flour if you'd like. It'll also, um, so the flour will kind of help it uh, bake into a firmer layer. So yeah. All right, so I'm gonna let that cool a little bit. And we're going to start working with our phyllo. So you can use like a 13 by 9 um, by 2 glass pan. Uh, you could also use a, a bigger pan. So my recipe kind of makes a pretty thick layer of pumpkin. Um, I like that, but if you want a thinner layer of pumpkin, I would suggest either adding less filling um, or making it in a bigger pan. You can make it in a round pan, um, however you'd like to make it. And I have just filo dough that I got from Safeway. Um, this has worked fine for me. Um, when you buy it frozen, you want to make sure it's completely thawed by the time you use it. So what I would suggest would be putting this in the fridge overnight to thaw slowly and then pulling it out maybe like an hour or two before um, you want to use it so it can get to room temperature. Um, when I would first start baking with filo, I used to like use it right away when it was frozen and it would just like shatter into a million pieces. Um, and it's okay if your filo tears or rips a little bit, but when it's all super broken, it can be more difficult to work with. So, this should be good. I'm just gonna open this. And then you just want to roll it out kind of gently. Like I said, it's okay if you're like here, I have a few tears, 
but um, really the melted butter is your best friend um, during this part because you can use the butter as kind of glue to like glue any holes or tears in your field together. Um, so yeah, we have a Sorry, we have a question yeah. about the butter. How do you keep your butter warm during the buttering process? Yeah, so actually I melted this butter earlier and I can see that it solidified. Um, so I'm gonna pop this in the microwave just to get it um, melted again. Um, so yeah, I would just kind of melt it or maybe you could like heat it over the stove or keep it in a, in a warm place. But yeah, I'm gonna keep this up real quick. Okay. <laughs> It shouldn't take you too long to assemble the pizza, so I don't think your butter will solidify in like the 10, 20 minutes it takes you um, to make it. I melted that like an hour or two earlier. Okay. So essentially um, for this part, you'll also want a good uh, pastry brush and we're gonna butter the pan first and then we're gonna butter each sheet of phyllo between each layer. And we're probably will do about like eight to 10 layers of phyllo on the bottom. Um, and then put our filling in, or half of our filling. Let me get that butter real quick. Okay, that's better. So we're gonna do the eight to 10 layers of phyllo on the bottom and then put half of our filling in. And then do two more layers of phyllo and then put the other half of the filling in and then put the rest of the layers of the phyllo on top. The reason I like to put the two layers of phyllo in the middle is I just feel like it kind of helps um, break it up a little bit and keep all the, you know, all the pumpkin from just becoming one solid block. So that's kind of why I like to do that. So I used to also be really particular about this stage because I didn't want my phyllo to dry out. I've kind of gotten to the point now where I can do it relatively quickly. Um, but if it takes you a while to do all your phyllo layers, I would recommend kind of getting like a damp towel and maybe laying it over um, your phyllo so it doesn't dry out in between layers. So I'm gonna start making this. So I'm gonna butter my fish. Have you found any other substitutions for buttering the dish? Like I know some people use like um, olive oil. Do you use that with, with this as well? Yes, yeah, so you can um, definitely, like I was saying earlier, you can definitely use uh, olive oil at this stage, especially if you want to make it uh, fasting okay. or you just don't, don't want to use butter. Um, you could also, uh, I was, you know, since the charity and the orphanage is in India, I was kind of thinking about ghee. I know a lot of people mm. in India use ghee. Um, so essentially what ghee is, uh, if people don't kind of aren't familiar with it, is it's clarified butter. So butter is actually only 80% fat and the other 20% is water or like milk solids. Uh, so ghee, essentially what they do with ghee is they heat up the butter uh, and to a point where all like the water kind of evaporates off and they can scoop the milk solids off from the top. So in our case, it's 100% uh, butter or butter fat. Um, oil is also, I guess, 100% fat. Um, why I like to use butter for this kind of thing and for other pastry recipes is actually because of butter's water content. Um, so what that does when you bake something with butter, especially in this sense, um, the water evaporates in the oven and creates these little like, air pockets and, um, in the filo dough, and that's what makes it flaky. That's what makes like a flaky crust. Um, so you could definitely use oil or ghee, um, if you'd like to. Uh, your crust just might not be quite as flaky, but I'm sure it would still be delicious. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm also um, layering this a few different ways. So I'm kind of doing some layers where uh, I'm laying the phyllo kind of directly square onto my pan. But the other layers, like this layer, I'm going to kind of go this way and cover half my pan to make sure that the edges are nice and sealed and that every part of the pan, um, you know, is covered evenly with phyllo. So, kind of do this kind of fast. And at this point as well, if anybody has any questions for Sophia or for us with um, Philly, you can unmute yourselves, you can write in the chat box. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. So 
Sophia, I think you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> Thank you. Every aspect and the story and the different spices that you're using and really instructing us step by step to this amazing dish. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely enjoyed um, making this dish. You know, I, I wasn't, the first time I actually made um, polifilopita, it was in Greece. My, um, my Thea's mother, who I just call one of my yas, um, she showed me how she makes polifilopita with uh, zucchini, but she also made it sweet and she grated the zucchini. Um, and then we kind of drained the water out of it. And then she, we also made homemade phyllo, which that was really fun to make. I haven't actually really been successful making homemade phyllo since then. <laughs> um, it's definitely kind of finicky and you have to kind of have like a long rolling pin in order to roll it out and stretch it uh, appropriately. So that's something I've definitely been wanting to, to you know, get better at. But um, so I wasn't able to really find um, a lot of recipes for a polo online and um, so I kind of found a few that I saw that were in Greek and kind of figured out what they were doing um, and a lot of people make it with pumpkin and they make it savory with like feta and dill um, but I just thought it'd be fun to make it sweet it's kind of like a Greek pumpkin pie so uh, I had a lot of fun like developing this recipe and I think my family had fun tasting it so I think it worked out well <laughs> so anyways I did probably about 10 layers. I was kind of lost count throughout the end. Um, but as you can see, our filling was really like thickened up at this point, which is great. And we want to put half of it in the bottom, like I was saying earlier, and just spread it out evenly. Um, and like I said, this will make quite a thick layer of the, of the filling. I mean, if you don't want that big of a layer, you could definitely put less. Right. Yeah. And then after we get this all smoothed out, like I said, we're gonna do two more layers of the filo dough. So I'd say that's probably about half. And you can see there aren't um, that many raisins in here. So like, like I said, if you want to add more, definitely go for it. And these next two layers, um, instead of, you probably saw I was kind of layering things like this. Um, just because I want to fully cover the filling, I'm just going to layer them uh, long ways. And just do a light coat of butter. What region from Greece um, were you visiting? Um, up north uh, in a village outside of Thessaloniki. Yeah. So um, the village is called Petrokerasa, which means like, you know, like rock hard cherries. <laughs> they have a lot of cherry trees up there. It's a really beautiful um, village and some of my family still lives there now. But yeah, when I went, I basically, um, told um, my Thea that I wanted to learn all these like traditional dishes and she taught me how to make the polikidopita um, with zucchini uh, like I said but then we also made domadas and I was really bad at rolling those. <laughs> I need to work on my domada rolling skills but um, she actually had this little machine that would kind of help you roll it so she gave me that because I wasn't rolling them well enough but <laughs> um, we also made yummy stuff. So that was great. I have these all these recipes written down, but they're not like really exact recipes like this. It's not like a teaspoon of this, a cup of this. It's kind of um, like a coffee mug of sugar and like a little kazanaki of salt and whatnot. So this recipe is a little bit more exact, but <laughs> you could also totally eyeball it like any good you know grease cook. <laughs> Almost done with this. And we're going to bake this. Um, I think my recipe says to bake it at 350 degrees, um, but it takes a little bit longer um, to bake this, probably closer to like an hour. Um, I did make one recently and I bumped it up to 375, um, and it only took about 
45 minutes, I know a little bit more than that. So um, I'm gonna bake this one at 375. All right, and now I'm just gonna finish putting all this phyllo on. Try to butter as fast as possible. <laughs> So I did, um, when I was first kind of figuring out how to make this, I did make it um, with the canned pureed pumpkin. Um, and it worked out just fine. Um, it was just a little bit of like a denser um, texture, kind of like I was saying, but it was equally as delicious. Um, you can also, if you were to make a kuliki popita with zucchini, um, kind of like I was saying earlier, uh, you wouldn't have to go through this whole method of Roasting and kind of scooping out the flesh, and I suppose you could, but kind of an easier way to do it is just to peel your zucchini and then grate it and then uh, put it in a colander, put some salt and sugar in there, or um, just salt if you want it to be savory, and then kind of press all the excess water out. Um, and then from there would kind of be the same idea. Uh, if you wanted to make this with like a butternut squash, you could either roast it and um, just use the flesh, kind of like we did with the pumpkin. Um, or if you could also grate it, I suppose, you could grate it and kind of squeeze the water out. Um, I've seen people kind of do those. So it's really just whatever your preference is. And it's kind of fun to do your own thing in the kitchen and feel like you made your own little original thing. But, Is anyone out there making this live or <laughs> let me know how it's going if anyone is. Let's see who we see. I can see maybe Helen's making it. I see a lot of people taking notes. Helen, you're gonna have to if if you if you like, you're gonna have to show us how it's it's looking. <laughs> Here. I okay. unmuted oh, you. Good. So I'm adapting. <laughs> um, because <laughs> I had no phyllo today. Um, so I'm using uh, some um, pastry. And so I was really concerned with the mixture that I'm making. And I think I'm just, it's going to bake like a pie probably. So okay. that's a real um, adaption. But I, I just <laughs> thought I'd try it. That sounds interesting. Let's see. Thanks. Definitely Thanks for sharing. Like High crust or like puff pastry? Yes. Uh, we also have a question from Elizabeth. Is fresh pumpkin better than canned regarding the nutritional value? Um, nutritionally, I think they're pretty similar. So this is actually something that um, I actually get a lot of questions about when people usually have false perceptions of canned vegetables. Um, nutritionally, they're pretty similar to their fresh counterparts. And uh, I think canned vegetables, you know, might be the only way that some people do get vegetables into their diet. And so canned is always better than nothing. Um, but I just think the texture is a little bit better with the fresh pumpkin in this case. Um, but yeah, I'm not opposed to canned vegetables at all. You do want to, if you do get canned vegetables though, you might want to check out the sodium content just to make sure not super, super high in sodium. Even something that says low sodium can have like 140 milligrams of sodium in it. So they're sneaky. Some of those claims can be kind of sneaky. Um, okay, so I just finished my last sheet of filo dough. Um, at this point, you could do several things. You could kind of cut off the excess um, dough around the sides, um, or you could kind of try to cut it off and then push it down on the sides. Um, I kind of just like to roll it on top. I think it makes a nice little um, crust. So I'm just going to start at this corner here and just roll it inwards and kind of really tuck it down and then just kind of roll as I go. You guys can see that okay. And just make sure it's all nice. Like that. And some of your fuel edges might be kind of dry and flaky and break off. That's totally fine.
And then after we get this all rolled up, we're going to butter it as well so it gets nice and golden brown. And these corner parts like have a lot of filo, so like I might kind of tear some off just so I don't have like a super, super thick um, corner crust there. And yeah, I'm gonna tuck it in. It doesn't have to be perfect. It honestly kind of looks better when it's all a little flaky and broken. Um, and then I'm gonna take some more butter and kind of tap it on the edges. And then you can also kind of take your brush and kind of like tuck the edges in like that. I kind of like to do that, make it look a little bit cleaner. And then um, one last step that's actually really important. Um, I think it, it looks nice, but also just to make it easier after this is done baking is you're going to score it. So you're not gonna wanna um, cut all the way down to the bottom of your pizza, but you just wanna cut maybe through the first few layers of phyllo and kind of into the filling. Um, and so you can do, you can make kind of any size or pattern of a score that you would like. Um, I've made it where it's just like really big pieces, like I just do one cut down the middle and then cut it. Um, those pieces are pretty big, especially with like the thickness of the filling um, that I do. So I think I'm going to do like three rows and then do rows like this. So I'm just gonna kind of measure that out. And like I said, I'm just kind of cutting through just the first few layers. And then I cut this side. You might have to hold the top layer a little bit so that um, your knife doesn't, you know, pull it too much. Sophia, while you are cutting, I just want to tell you that everybody is enjoying this and saying what a great job. And you have such positive comments coming in. So Sophia's cooking right now and cannot see them all so I just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, okay so here's what final product almost final product looks like. One last thing you could do take a little water make the sign of the cross pour it in. <laughs> it also gives it a nice little you know, water effect on top. But anyway so yeah 375 degrees this will go in for um probably about 45 minutes, um, but you'll know it's done when it's golden brown on top. So I'm gonna put this in. All right, so that is it for the cola pita pita. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything. Um, I've also seen people that do this uh, and they make a syrup, like people make for baklava or baklava and they pour syrup over then too. All right, I think this is pretty sweet already, but if you just want to add the next layer, you could definitely do that. I did prep um, a cola pizza before this, so um, you could taste it. So I'm gonna go grab that. So magic cooking show trick. This is the final um, Philippi Bobita. So yeah, nice and golden brown on top. You could go in a little bit longer too if you kind of want a deeper color. But we'll go ahead and cut into this. And I love to serve this um, with a little powdered sugar and cinnamon on top. So let me get that. So cutting into filo dough also makes kind of a mess. <laughs> and the first piece, I always say like the first piece that whenever you put in something is never the best looking piece because you kind of have to like scoop it out, but let's see if we can get one out. I'm gonna have to cut that one out. So um, you could 
also uh, make this ahead of time. So um, if you prep this and before you baked it um, and you put it in kind of like a metal or aluminum pan, not a glass pan, um, you could freeze it before you bake it. And then uh, when you want to bake it, just kind of pop it um, right in the oven. So it is something that you could um, make ahead. See, that's not going to be the prettiest piece, but I'll get the next one. When, when you go to warm it up, um, what do you recommend for temperature and um, duration? Um, I would, if you're cooking it from frozen, um, I would probably do the same temperature, um, but you might have to bake for a little bit longer. Um, and I would, again, just kind of wait for the filo dough to get brown on top. And if you feel like it's brown on top, but it hasn't like cooked through all the way, um, you could cover it with like aluminum foil so that it doesn't get any more brown on top if you want to keep it cooking. But it should be the same time and temperature. It should be just fine. Okay. So <laughs> it's kind of coming out all over the place, but there is our filo like I said, it's a lot of filling in there and it's still really hot. So if you're gonna serve this um, and you don't want really nice pieces, um, I would let it cool for at least an hour, maybe more. Then you'll get more of like a setup filling. Like I made this probably like 30 minutes ago or maybe an hour ago, but okay. So now we have that and I'm just going to, can you see that okay? That's what it looks like. Um, and I just take some powdered sugar. Is this on the camera okay? You see it? Yes. Okay. And I'm just gonna kind of go like this. Oop. Powdered sugar. And then just take some cinnamon. And I'm also gonna put that in here. And kind of sprinkle that over the top as well. Maybe a little bit more. Um, and it's just a nice little adds a nice little sweetness to it and brings out those that cinnamon flavor. And then um, we also have some whipped cream to go with it, which is really good. Whipped cream is also really easy to make from scratch, but if you just have the canned kind, that's fine too. No ice cream also goes really good with it for a dessert. So let me pull that out. So, let's see if we can just you can kind of like that, or you can put it on top, whatever you like. You could also um, do these in, as um, triangles. So I guess that would be like Polo Kiko Pitakia. Um, and that would be kind of fun too, as little like bite sized desserts, and having um, a little powdered sugar on top of those would be nice too. So I'm gonna taste this and let me know, um, Ellen, if you're making it too, if you're tasting it too. <laughs> How is it? It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. It's really good. And I probably have powdered sugar all over my face, but <laughs> um, it's really good. Yeah, I really like the walnuts and the raisins in there. It kind of just helps break up the filling. Um, and all the spices come through really nicely. And the cinnamon and, and the nutmeg and the ginger really bring like a really delicious warmth to it. So yeah, that's basically what I have for my Kulakiko um, Pita. Are there any more questions that I can answer for anyone? I commend you for doing an amazing job. You brought not only warmth to our hearts, but joy from the glow that comes out of you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Sophia, yeah, um, congrats. Uh -huh. This is Theo and Cliff in Seattle. Uh, beautiful. Oh, hi. Hi, honey. A beautiful job. You're, you're becoming a professional chef. <laughs> Very nice. God bless you. And God bless the work you all are doing. Thanks, Cleo. I mean, Cleo. Yeah, 
This is Sheila. Um, I, I want to say thank you. I'm actually, I attend St. Nicholas in Tacoma. And, and so, Sophia, I, I hopped on tonight because of you, because watching you each Sunday, I thought, I, I, want, to, I want to know more about her. And what you did tonight, you introduced me to something bigger. And um, I'm really going to be checking out more um, about the orphanage and my heart's all over this, this. so thank you for, for saying yes. Good, thank you so much, it means a lot. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so thanks everyone for signing on, and really, um, it really wasn't about me, it really wasn't about the Philippi Book of Sally, it really was about the orphanage and all the good work that Sister Nicodia does, and also the Metropolitan Monsentinos. I know that he's kind of traveled along the West Coast, and some of you um, I know him, he's, maybe he's visited your parishes, but um, also Project Feely, obviously, and big thanks to them for including me in this um, so I could share my food with you guys and raise money. So um, if you, hopefully you'll have a recipe for this. Um, again, if you have any questions about this, you could definitely uh, find my Instagram. It's just Sophia Sedina. Feel free to shoot me a message. Um, I post recipes on there every once in a while and some fun nutrition tidbits. So. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and um, just want to say some clo closing remarks as well. Sorry, one second. Okay. Um, thank you as well to Sophia uh, for that wonderful demonstration. Sophia, you had so many messages uh, coming in. Everybody just had really great things to say. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for assisting with the audio visual. Uh, we've included your information for websites and Instagrams in the chat box. Um, we would also love to see pictures tonight from those of you that made it either tonight or in the upcoming days. So please make sure to tag us. We're at Project Philly um, on Instagram, Facebook, um, but we will repost on Instagram. So that would be the best way to tag. Uh, and we will post this video on YouTube as well. So you'll be able to see it whenever. Um, you should all have the recipes. If not, let us know and we'll send those out again. And big thank you to all of you for being participants, for being here and for your support tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.